Lucille wanted to know what hospital he was in or what was his condition, and she had begun to pack. Then Michelle called again and said Steve was dead. She said, Doc, they said it was some 20 year old girl. When they said that girl killed him, there ain't no way. She received an anonymous letter. And whoever crafted that letter certainly felt that the girl was not the killer. I was started hearing little bits and pieces here and there, and right away I was like, something's not right here. You got three people looking at the exact same crime scene, but they're writing different accounts of where the gun was found. All these weird things are going, like checks are missing. I heard there was a gambling debt. It was a mob hit, and he was found, his genitals were cut off. It was such an open, closed case. Who could tell Nashville police to do a cover-up? Well, this high-profile judge really looked like somebody knew exactly how to fire those type of rounds. And then they say, how you got shot? I said, oh, professional shooting. This is Tim Rowan. Welcome to Fall of a Titan. Over the course of his 13 years in the NFL, Steve McNair reportedly earned at least $90 million. And early on, after he made it big, Steve wrote his mother Lucille a letter, telling her she didn't have to work anymore. Then he built her a house on a 600-plus acre plot of land near Mount Olive, Mississippi, not far from where he'd grown up. They came to call that property The Ranch. When Steve took his mother to The Ranch for the first time, Lucille McNair started crying. She told him she'd pick cotton there, right there, when she was young. Steve had, by mere happenstance, purchased the very land that her family had worked on as sharecroppers another lifetime ago. In the ensuing years, the ranch became like Steve McNair's second home after his place in Nashville. Steve would come and pass the time by riding tractors and horses. He would tend to his 130 or so cattle, work the land, and get a little taste of what life had been like before football, before fame. On the day of Steve's funeral, Lucille McNair hosted a reception at the ranch. And at one point that day, Dr. Alvin Simpson, a close family friend of the McNairs had a conversation with Steve's agent, Bus Cook, at the dining room table. Doc asked Bus, had Steve left behind a will? McNair owned multiple homes, he'd started a restaurant, and he'd run a foundation. There was a whole network of people who either worked for Steve or relied on him in one way or another. Then there was his mother, his four brothers, and the four children he'd fathered with three different women. There were a lot of assets that needed to be sorted through and distributed, and Doc was curious. Had Steve made clear how he wanted this process carried out? Doc says that Bus Cook told him yes. Steve had drawn up a will, but he had left it unsigned. The way I feel here in 2018, that will is very important, signed or unsigned. Because if Steve had intended for everything to go one way, he wouldn't have needed a will at all. So there might be people who were named in his will that we don't know about. It's not, it's not out of the ordinary that you are married and you have children and you make provisions for other people in your will. So I asked Bus about that will on the day of the funeral. He and I sat together at Lucille's dining room table. And um, when he mentioned that it was unsigned and that he had encouraged Steve to come and sign the will and so forth, I asked, I said, Bus, can you go by the intent of the will? And he said that he would find out. But to this very day, no one has shared the wheel. A few weeks later, the Associated Press interviewed Buzz Cook about Steve's finances in the wake of his death. Cook told the AP that McNair had wills drafted two or three times before he died, but that the retired quarterback never signed them. Cook said that his client had left instructions that would take care of his entire immediate family. Everybody's going to be fine. Everything's going to be good. And there's no disagreements between anybody, Cook said. It wouldn't end up being that clean and easy, though, not even close. Steve McNair's estate at the time of his death was valued at about $19.6 million. It was a meager slice of that $90 million in career earnings, but $19 million is $19 million. And because Steve didn't leave behind a signed will, control of his estate was handed over to the surviving spouse, Michelle McNair. Vincent Hill, the private investigator, takes this simple fact and runs with it. Of every path Vincent has led me down, this one may be the darkest. He believes that the police should have brought Michelle in for questioning in regards to Steve's death. In one of his books about McNair, Vincent writes, quote, Who would have the most to gain from Steve's death? The 20-year-old female who is receiving thousands of dollars a week from her lover? Or the wife, who is fearful that Steve's millions would dwindle away? 
I want to take a second here to remind you, the Nashville police never considered Michelle McNair a suspect. They found no evidence that she had anything to do with her husband's death. But I do think it's worthwhile to take a closer look at Michelle and her actions before and after her husband's murder to show you how she fits into this story and why Vincent and others may be suspicious of her. Steve and Michelle McNair had a complicated relationship. They met back in college at Alcorn State, where Steve was the star quarterback and Michelle was a member of the dance team. They married in June 1997 at a church in Michelle's hometown, not far from their old campus. This was two years after Steve received his first NFL contract, a seven-year deal worth a reported $28 million. Steve and Michelle had two children together, Tyler, who was born in 1998, and Trenton, who came along in 2004. But all apparently wasn't well in the McNair household. Steve was sleeping around, and Michelle apparently had some knowledge of it. Doc Simpson told me that Steve would pick fights with Michelle just so he could get out of the house. Doc said that sometimes when they got into these battles and Michelle would challenge Steve, he would fire back. Do you want a divorce? It apparently wasn't an empty threat either. Doc Simpson told me that Steve confided in him sometime around 2003 that he was thinking about filing for divorce. Doc remembers that it was late at night, maybe 3.30, 4 in the morning, and it was just the two of them alone, sitting and chatting. Well, we were talking about a lot of things. As, as we would always do. And he brought up the fact that he was unhappy with nagging and, and, and all of that. I mean, you know, just, just marital woes. But I felt that it was my place to be a peacemaker and not a peace breaker because I never held anything against Michelle. I always considered Michelle to be a fine person. So I was speaking on her behalf because, you know, I like Michelle. Doc discouraged Steve from ending his marriage. He told Steve he didn't need that kind of publicity. Doc suggested that he and Michelle try to work things out. I felt that perhaps there could be some compromise where they could actually work it out. So I did what I thought was honorable. I talked to him and I said, you don't need that kind of drama. Try to make it work. And he did. He did. So whatever the dynamics were after that, I really can't say. Steve listened to Doc's advice. He didn't divorce Michelle. But it doesn't appear that he changed his behavior either. He still went out a lot. He still saw other women. He was gone so often that, at one point, Michelle invited her mother to come live with them, seemingly to keep Michelle company. And Steve's friends told me he did not like that change. Not one bit. Listen to Steve's close friend from college, Jerry Fletcher. I knew that he wanted some privacy because her mother and stuff was up there, and he wanted all of them out the house, I know. He said that one time he can't even walk around the house naked because there's so many people in the house. So now that bothered him that her family was staying with them. Steve wanted more privacy, and so he went and rented a condo in downtown Nashville sometime around 2005. It would be a place where he could get away from his wife, a place where he could take his mistresses. Steve told at least two of these other women that he was in the process of divorcing Michelle. He said that to Jenny Kazemi, and he said that to Leah Ignani, another woman he was seeing. Here's Leah with the police shortly after Steve's murder. He said that they were in the process of divorcing. They had been for the last two years. He said that he was selling the house here. They were going through the divorce. He was single mom, da da da. But yeah, I mean, I, he didn't have a date. It wasn't anything like that. Now, it's entirely possible that McNair was just saying this to appease his mistresses. But a few of Steve's friends say Steve told them the same thing. He was considering getting a divorce in the final few years of his life. Listen to what Spurgeon Banyard, one of Steve's college teammates, told me. Well, everybody knows that for the last two years of Steve's life, Steve wanted a divorce from his wife, but she would not give him one. As they were going through hardship in their marriage, I felt like the wife committed the ultimate sin. I don't want to use the word sin, but the ultimate mistake. She invited her mom from Mississippi to come and live with them. And when you're going through problems as a married couple, you don't bring family members to move into your home, especially your mom. And when that took place, that's when Steve moved out and got him a condominium. So I feel like her family tried to paint the picture as to Steve was cheating on her, but in actuality, her and Steve's marriage had been over with for over two years. And he had been begging her for a divorce and she wouldn't give him one. Banyard said Steve was begging Michelle for a divorce. He was sleeping around, he'd rented this condo, but Michelle wouldn't give him one. She had good reason not to, though. According to several of Steve's friends, Michelle and Steve had a prenuptial agreement. Steve told Doc about the prenup himself. According to Doc, Steve said, 
If you were ever get divorced, Michelle would receive $300,000, a house, and child support payments. That's it. Jerry Fletcher and Steve's cousin, John Holloway, told me they were also aware of the prenup. Torrance Small, another one of Steve's college teammates, told me he talked to Steve before Steve's wedding, and he came away with the strong impression that the McNairs would be signing a prenup. Doc Simpson says that the prenup was not really a secret. Not at all. Oh, yeah. Everybody knew that. Everybody knew that. That's why I have a problem with the fact that that prenup has not been introduced as an issue with all the stuff that's been going on. Steve and Michelle never got divorced, so you may wonder, what does this matter? Well, a standard prenup often addresses what happens if a marriage ends in divorce or if it ends in death. There are usually instructions about what's supposed to happen if one of the two people dies. At least, that's how they're often written. We don't know if Steve and Michelle's prenup included such language, because, like the will, the prenup has never surfaced. What we do know now, though, is that over the final six months of his life, several of Steve McNair's friends say they noticed him acting differently. For one, he wasn't worried about hiding his affairs anymore, or at least his affair with Jenny Kazami. Steve would be seen with Jenny in public around Nashville. Chris Wall, Steve's bodyguard, told me Steve just didn't care anymore what people thought. I could definitely tell a difference after Steve retired. Uh, there was so much stress going on in his life that he, he just, almost like he didn't care anymore. I think he had already made his mind up what direction he was going to go in with his marriage. And he just didn't, he just had an I don't care attitude. He really wasn't trying to hide anything. He was doing the same thing Steve always done, but he just was more careless about it, more carefree. He didn't. He just had attitude he didn't care. Like when they, uh, him and Jenny went to um, Key West, they knew the pictures were out there. They knew that uh, the photographers were taking pictures, but Steve didn't care. You know, he he just wanted to have fun and uh, wanted to just hang out. Steve also seemed to be spending lavishly on his mistresses. He took Jenny on that trip to Key West. He helped her buy a Cadillac Escalade. Then he'd give her thousands of dollars at a moment's notice. Lee Ignani, the other mistress, told police that Steve hadn't taken her on any trips, but that they'd discussed things like that. After Steve's death, it even came out in the media that he'd been paying rent for another woman, a third woman. McNair would reportedly make the payments himself, in person. Then, while Steve was spending all this money on these mistresses, on people other than his wife, the McNairs ran into some financial issues. Doc Simpson told me that, at one point, Steve had lost a lot of money in a bad investment. I remember in March of 2009 and in June of 2009, Steve mentioned to me that he had invested a large sum of money through his CPA, Marshall Wright, and that he was told that he lost the whole investment. And I said, well, Steve, what was the investment? He said, Doc, I don't know. I said, what do you mean you don't know? And, and you've lost millions of dollars. He said, I don't know. He said, I'm trying to find out. So Steve went to his grave not knowing what the investment was. That issue has been suppressed to this very day. Did he tell you how much money he had lost? He said it was up in the millions. It was up in the millions. Doc says Michelle told him the same thing. They lost millions in a bad investment. Not only that, Marsha Wright, Steve's CPA, apparently told the McNairs they could be broke within two or three years, presumably unless they made some changes. Michelle mentioned that Marsha had told her that conceivably in two to three years, Steve could be broke. Well, I um, had some questions and reservations about that because Michelle said she had asked Marsha, do we need to get jobs or something? I found that to be so troubling because I'm saying to myself, I know the kind of contracts Steve got in the NFL. And I know that the purchases he's made, except for that home in Nashville on Bell Road, he paid for everything in cash. And I had observed his lifestyle, even though he was a good time kind of person. It would be hard to spend a millions like that. Mm -mm. That's just not going to happen. He was very free hearted, but that second contract was $47 million. And the, I didn't see any evidence of where he would have been spending money like that. If you look at McNair's probate files, the idea that Marsha Wright would tell Steve he was going broke, something's off there. At the time of Steve's death, remember, his estate was worth about $19.6 million. And that only counted the assets in Steve's name alone. That figure doesn't include joint properties, 
or any financial accounts Steve may have shared with Michelle. It's likely the McNairs were worth much more than $19.6 million, in fact. They were far from broke. Nevertheless, Doc told me that at one point he wrote a letter to Steve, telling him to take a closer look at where all of his money was going. I got a sheet of paper and I, I got a marker and I wrote to him, Steve, promise me that you will have an audit done on all of your accounts. They are still stealing money. Doc said Steve had begun looking at his accounts, but it's not entirely clear what Steve found. In Doc Simpson's view, there was one person Steve would listen to in these types of financial situations, and that was his agent, Buss Cook. If you don't know, Cook is one of the highest powered agents of the past 30 years in the NFL. He's best known perhaps for representing Brett Favre, but he's also handled the likes of Randy Moss, Calvin Johnson, Cam Newton, Russell Wilson, and Jay Cutler. It's kind of remarkable to think that Buss started this big-time sports agency working out of Hattiesburg, Mississippi. Buss was just getting his career off the ground in the early 90s, when Steve McNair started making headlines just a couple hours away in Lorman, Mississippi, at Alcorn State. It was really a fortunate situation for Buss. He found Brett Favre at Southern Miss. Now here was another star QB, practically in his backyard. In those early years, Buss went to a lot of Steve's games, trying to recruit him as a client. Jerry Fletcher, Steve's backup at Alcorn State, told me that as part of that recruiting process, Buss Cook would pay Steve money under the table. Remember, Steve had come from a poor background and he could use the extra cash. Listen to Jerry Fletcher tell the story. By Steve freshman year, he told me uh, we used to walk to the gym, me and him, and he said, Fletcher, I'm tired of walking, man. I promise you next year we're not going to walk. I said, huh, how are we going to do that? You know, we're just 18 years old. We don't know no better. We're playing ball, but you know. He said, I promise you, we ain't going to walk no more next year. And that's when, you know, that was before the season started. He, we were freshmen, and then he be, his name got out there, and he became, you know, real good. And a lot of people wanted to be his agent, and so Buzz could want to be his agent. And I guess he saw the promise in Steve, and so he started taking care of Steve. Did you guys not walk? Did Steve get a car, or what, what happened? Oh, yeah, the next year we had a car. Yes, sir. Rode all the time. <laughs> He said he didn't get that car for him, he got that car for us. Mm -hmm. Fletcher said he'd go with Steve to visit Buss and pick up money. He said they went maybe once a month. Me and Steve used to disappear all the time, and we used to go to Buss Cook office all the time. You know, he'd pick up a little, some money or whatever, and then we used to leave and come on back to Alcorn. We did that numerous occasions. How much money was he getting? Do you have any idea? Well, when me and him was going down there, he was getting exactly 5000 Did he have that same car all three years? Mm, the same year he got a Lexus. Oh, yeah. That must have turned some heads. Oh, yes, yeah, sir. That turned some heads. Yes, sir. He have a ride, man. Mm. Marcus Hinton was also on that Alcorn State team, and he was also a good friend of McNair's. He met Buzz Cook through Steve, and he too would later hire Cook as his agent. I asked Marcus about these payments. Was Buzz giving Steve money or, or you know, helping him out financially back then? In the back of, I don't know if he was in high school, but I mean, in college, I mean, he was sort of looking out for us. Spurgeon Banyard heard the same thing back in the day. Cook was paying Steve back in college. I ran all this by Bus Cook, and he denied that he ever paid Steve. Nevertheless, when McNair went pro, he hired Cook to act both as his agent and his attorney. Bus negotiated contracts with the Oilers and then the Titans on Steve's behalf. Usually dead with Floyd Reese, the Titans' former general manager. Floyd told me Bus was more than an agent to Steve. He was an advisor, a mentor, a conduit. Floyd said Steve and Buss really bonded because they were both country boys at heart. They would go have a meeting at Buss's house, and the meeting would last about five minutes, and they'd go out to lake fishing, you know, and they'd be out there drinking beer and fishing. I mean, that's, that's what you do. So that was, you know, the relationship I thought was uh, was close. And like I said, I think Buss, you know, Steve and, and Brett both were more than just clients. You know, they were his kids and his friends and his clients and his brothers. I mean, they were, they were close. Doc Simpson refers to Buss as the godfather because Steve seemed to rely heavily on Buss's wisdom and guidance. Doc was under the impression that Buss had been the one who set Steve up with a CPA and with a banker to handle his money. He figured it was Buss who Steve would have gone to if he wanted to put together a will. Flash forward to 2009, Steve is retired from football. He's renting a condo away from his family. He's dating a 20 year old waitress and he's apparently having money issues. According to Doc Simpson, at least, Steve has just lost millions of dollars in a bad investment, and his CPA is suggesting he may be broke in a few years. Jerry Fletcher told me that, 
Sometime around that May or June, just before Steve's death, he was hanging out with McNair, and he could tell that something was wrong. Steve wasn't talking. He was acting distant, and he had this look in his eye. Man, he was just, his look on his face, like, I never seen that look on his face, never in the 25 years. The look on his face, like, somebody was messing with his money, or somebody was messing with his family. And me knowing him, I said, ain't nobody messing with his family, because Steve had a bunch of guns. He would probably shoot you. He loves shooting. So I'm saying, somebody messing with the man money. So I went over to Freddie's house, his older brother. I, I called Freddie outside, I talked to him. I said, Freddie, what's going on with Steve? You know, because he didn't want to talk about it. I told Freddie, I said, man, somebody is messing with Steve money because Steve ain't never act that way towards us. Never in 25 years I've known him. He never act that way. And he was acting mighty strange. And you could see the distraught on his face that something was bothering him very deeply. And um, then I found out that it was on a bad investment. And I could see why a man would look like that. Calvin Robinson, another one of Steve's college teammates, told me that sometime around May, Steve made a comment about not putting faith in people. Steve told Robinson, you can't trust everybody, you know? Steve was apparently feeling a bit paranoid up until the end of his life. On the last weekend of June 2009, about one week before Steve died, he attended a baseball tournament in Mississippi. And there, Steve made a strange comment to John Holloway, his cousin. All day we had a, a baseball tournament where he had a baseball tournament. And like he told me that day, oh, he was like, man, stay around me all day. I got a lot of people don't like me. You know, I didn't know what was going on or whatever, you know. So I stood around him all day. He was like, he had a lot of people didn't like him. You know, so he didn't know what for what reason or what. He just said he had a lot of people didn't like him. And he wanted you next to him just in case, I don't know, in case someone would try to shoot him? Yeah, try to do anything to him or whatever. Did he seem afraid or, or nervous at all or when he said that? Yeah, you can you can tell he was kind of kind of nervous a little bit when he said it. You can tell he was nervous because of the way he said it. And I looked at him and he was like, I could tell when he's serious and not serious because we were real close to him. And he was kind of nervous in this fish. Yes, he was. After the tournament, Steve apparently wanted to stay in Mississippi. But Michelle, it seems, wanted to go back to Nashville. Well, his wife wanted him to go back to Nashville for some reason or whatever. Like, he wanted to stay down for the rest of the week or whatever. But she was like, no, nah, we're going back to Nashville. Like, the kids wanted to stay at his, girl, at his mom house to swim, you know. But she was like, no, nah, we're going to get back to Nashville. And I just knew that was, you know, that's not Steve. He's going he to be out here on the 4th of July regardless. In 10 years, I can remember he ain't never been in Nashville. He always been down here on the 4th. For as long as friends could remember, Steve McNair had spent the 4th of July in Mississippi at the ranch, getting ready for his annual summer party. At one point every summer, Steve would throw a big bash and invite everyone in the community. He'd barbecue all day, bring out a beer truck, and set off fireworks at night. Fun day, Steve called it. But that year, instead of sticking around Mississippi, his wife had hurried him back to Nashville. Jerry Fletcher told me he found that odd. That's very strange, very strange. In the 20-something years I've known Steve, Steve did 4th of July. He was here a week early and did 4th of July in the state of Mississippi. That's why I know something is real strange about that. By then, Michelle McNair was apparently close to reaching her wit's end with Steve. Doc Simpson told me that, at the end of May, Michelle and her sister had come to see him at his office at Alcorn State. Doc said Michelle was going on and on about Steve's relationship with Jenny Kazami, and that Michelle referred to Jenny as, quote, the foreign bitch. Up to this point, Michelle has denied knowing anything about Steve and Jenny's relationship. There were some issues about Steve's infidelity, and I think Michelle was frustrated at that point. And she shared some things about what she had learned about an alleged affair that was going on. So the conversation was about, because at that point, you know, more, I mean, he'd been with Jenny for a little while and they'd been out in public and that had bothered Michelle, it sounds like. Well, yeah, because like I said, it wasn't a secret what Steve was doing anymore. And I can't provide a justification why at that point in his life, he didn't care anymore about who knew what was going on. 
So I think it was a personal thing. And in Michelle's defense, if I were married, I wouldn't want anybody messing around with my spouse either. During that visit at Alcorn State, Doc remembers Michelle talking about the McNair's finances. Doc says Michelle made a comment along the lines of, if something were to happen to Steve, she wouldn't know what to do because she had no idea about his business affairs. Then, about six weeks later, on July 4, 2009, Steve McNair turned up dead, and Michelle ended up with control of the estate. Fall of Titan is brought to you by Harry's. The holidays are right around the corner, and I already know what I'm going to get my brother as a present this year, a Harry's razor. Harry's makes quality razors at a super reasonable price. It's a practical gift that he'll actually use. Plus, Harry's will also let me personalize the razor for him. I can pick out a razor in whatever color he wants, and engrave his name on it. As a special offer for fans of the show, we've partnered with Harry's to give you $5 off any shave set, including our limited edition holiday sets, when you go to harrys.com slash titan. Plus, you'll get free shipping. This offer is for new and returning customers and is only available for the holidays. Each Harry's shaving set comes with an ergonomic weighted handle with an option to engrave, German-engineered five-blade cartridges that provide a close, comfortable shave, foaming shave gel for a rich lather, a travel cover to protect your blades, and a handsome holiday gift box. Or just want something for yourself? Redeem a Harry's trial offer to experience the quality of shave before committing. Get your holiday shopping done early. Free shipping ends December 12th, so act now. Go to harrys.com slash titan to get $5 off a shave set while supplies last. That's harrys.com slash titan. The day Steve McNair died, Chris Wall and Rick Bonner, two of Steve's bodyguards, told me they went over to Steve and Michelle's house to be with her and her two sons. Chris and Rick stayed for a good part of the day, and while they were there, they noticed a few things that struck them as odd. Chris Wall said that from the time he got there, Michelle was in business mode, running around trying to get things organized. The only thing that really struck me off for the first few hours was just the fact that that she, you know, she didn't either have the time or she didn't allow herself to uh, to break down to get to that level of, of being uncontrollable in her emotions. She stayed very um, like a busy bee, working on everything, looking for uh, different things. I even think that um, she was looking for certain things on the, on the laptop with Mike Moo. I think they were looking for a, a wheel fairly early. Chris said Michelle was on Steve's computer with Mike Moo, Steve's former assistant. Remember, Mike Moo was the first person I called when I started working on this podcast. He's the one who told me the family wouldn't be interested in talking. Chris told me he found it strange that Mike Moo was over at the house, because Mike's relationship with Steve had kind of soured for some reason that Chris wouldn't explain. But here was Mike Moo going through Steve's computer. I asked Chris to clarify. Did he think Michelle and Mike had been looking for Steve's unsigned will? I'm, I'm 99.9% sure Steve had a will. I'm sure Buzz Cook, his agent, had a copy of it. Steve had a copy of it, and I believe he had a copy that was a um, scan copy or a uh, document of some sort on the, on the laptop. But apparently there was some discussion about the wheel fairly early. And like I said, it was awfully strange for me to uh, see fairly early Mike move on Steve's laptop going through all the, you know, uh, Steve's personal, you know, stuff on this laptop. What happened to the wheel, or from what I've understood, uh, Bus Cook, from my understanding, uh, first I, I I think Big said that he couldn't find it or it was misplaced. Then it went from being misplaced to Steve never actually had it signed. The laptop somehow ended up coming up missing that they thought the wheel would be on. And Michelle says she's never seen one which, you know, I find it very odd for someone like Steve being as, as meticulous as he as he is with his family to go all this time and not have a will set aside for his family. Chris and Rick both told me that later that night, Michelle and her friends popped a bottle of champagne. Rick Bonner told me people were toasting to Steve and that there was a celebration going on. Chris told me he found it inappropriate. Rick agreed. It didn't sit well with him. Rick told me, Everybody has their way of dealing with grief, but I don't think Miss Lucille and Steve's brothers were toasting to him. Me and the other security guys, we were not in the toasting mood. 
Steve's cousin, John Holloway, told me that on the night of Steve's funeral, he saw Michelle and her family at the House of Blues in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. They were just in the club dancing and having a good time. And I, I left because I told them it's me because I don't want to be around them right now. I didn't want to be around them. So we ended up leaving the club, but they were still at part of like, you know, like wasn't nothing wrong. To me, they was kind of happy. You know, they was, they was partying and having a good time. They looked like they were happy to me. But anyway, I got back home and went to sleep. I just dream, and, and most time when I dream, it, it's usually true. When I dream, they were just in the club, like, we got all the money, they were just dancing and laughing, saying, we got all the money now, we got all the money now. You know, but that's just a dream. I don't know if any of these stories actually say anything about Michelle or her character. Again, everyone grieves differently. And when you start comparing how people grieve, that gets messy fast. It seems as though Steve's friends were watching Michelle, looking for clues in her behavior. Clues that led them to some really dark guesswork. But I think these stories do show how suspicion and speculation were rampant among those closest to Steve in the aftermath of his death. They also lead you to a pretty relevant question. Steve and Michelle were going through some rough times in their marriage, and Steve was said to be considering a divorce. You gotta wonder, what exactly was in Steve's unsigned will? According to Doc Simpson, there's one person who knows, at least partially. Doc told me Michelle saw Steve with a version of this will as recently as four months before Steve died. In March of 2009, Lucille and Michelle and I were sitting at the breakfast table, and she mentioned that Steve had come into the kitchen of their home in Nashville, and he had a, some paper rolled up in his hands, and he had a briefcase, and he laid the briefcase on the counter and laid this paper down, and she asked him what was it. And according to her, she said that it was his will. And she stated that when he went in the back room, she picked up and started reading it. But she didn't finish reading it. So she never described what it was that she read or anything else. She just said that she started reading it and, and, and she put it down so that he wouldn't say anything about her tampering with it. And when he was leaving, she said that he put that rolled up paper in the briefcase and left. Michelle had apparently seen Steve with a will, and she'd read a portion of it. I asked Doc, was there a chance Steve had cut Michelle out of his will? I can't really say one could theorize that, but maybe if she had not been cut out of the will, perhaps whatever kind of provision was made, it might not have been sufficient. We don't know. Now, Michelle saw the will. I don't know how much of the will she read. She stated to Lucille that she had seen the will, but she couldn't find it after Steve's murder. But the will exists, and everybody's just ignoring that. Doc said that around October 2009, about three months after Steve's death, Michelle called Lucille McNair, asking if she'd seen her son's will. She called Lucille to ask Lucille that she have a copy of the will. And Lucille said, no, Michelle, I don't have a copy of the will. And I would think that that might have been a question that her attorneys wanted to know. Because shortly after that, that's when everything started going downhill in terms of things taken from Lucille. Remember, when Steve died, Michelle gained control of his estate. Her job then was to sort through Steve's assets and divide them five ways, between herself and Steve's four children. And one of those assets that had to be divided was the ranch. That included the some 600 acres of farmland where Steve herded his cattle, and also the house where Steve's mother Lucille lived. In January 2010, Michelle filed court documents declaring that she was going to charge Lucille McNair rent, $3,000 a month, to live in the house that Steve built for her on the ranch. According to Doc Simpson, Lucille was told that if she refused to pay, the house would be sold off. Doc wanted to rally some of Steve's former teammates to buy the house for Lucille, but that idea never got very far. Torrance Small, one of Steve's college teammates, told me he looked into hiring an attorney for Lucille to help her stay in the house, but in the end he said, there really wasn't much that could be done. The house had been in Steve's name, and Michelle and the heirs could do whatever they wanted with it now that Steve was dead. Doc says he tried pleading with Michelle, but she indicated she was just following her attorney's advice. Before Michelle could sell off the ranch, though, she needed the approval of Steve's other heirs. Or, more precisely, because all Steve's four sons were minors, she needed the approval of the other mothers, Sheila McNair and Katina Fazell. 
and the probate documents on the matter indicate that Sheila and Katina signed off. They let Michelle do what she wanted. Sheila McNair told me that she didn't want to take the house away from Lucille, but she felt like there was nothing she could do to stop it, because Michelle, quote, had more pull than I did. Katina held off signing for a few weeks longer than Sheila did. One point, I did not sign for a while, but then I had to look at to what's best for my child and look at the, for the best interest for him. And my lawyer said I had to look at that, so that's when I decided, well, I got to sign these papers because if I don't, it's just going to hold up everything, I guess. That's what my understanding anyway. Why, why did you think it was in the best interest of, of your child? Well, listening to my lawyer, he was saying it's the best interest for him because the upkeep on the house, it had to be paid out of their trust or their money um, to keep it all, I guess, looking nice, I, I guess. Katina says her lawyer recommended that she sign the papers, and she followed that advice blindly. She also told me that lawyer had been recommended to her by Bus Cook. And so, in the end, Michelle had her way. It appears that by the end of March 2011, Lucille had moved out of the house at the ranch, the house that Steve built for her, the house that sat on the plot of land where she'd picked cotton as a young girl. That didn't sit well with a lot of Steve's friends. They felt that this whole thing with the house was Michelle's way of taking out her anger at Lucille. Some even think that Michelle blamed Lucille for allegedly turning a blind eye to Steve's infidelity. This is Tracy Farmer. She's a family friend of the McNair's. I heard that she was upset because she felt like Mama Mac knew about the girl and all of that. My thing is, Steve was the one was messing around. Mama Mac ain't got nothing to do with that. And why would you take anything out on her? You know, it wasn't her. Why would you do that? And I, you know, I just didn't, I didn't understand that. That just blows my mind every time I think about it. I don't see how she lived with herself. I don't see how she sleep, you know, because who would do that? You, you, you're you taking the little bit that Steve had left for her. You're taking it from her, you know. That's her son. And he built it for her. You know, that's just, that. I just didn't see any sense in that. I asked Brian Mix, another college teammate, what would Steve do if you were around to see his mother's home being taken away? A hell would freeze over. He would give everything he had to make sure that didn't happen. You understand what I'm saying? He wouldn't handle that well at all. That wouldn't be good because that's his backbone right there. That's his backbone, mama. Eventually, Michelle sold the ranch for roughly $1.4 million. That's $1.4 million for Lucille's big house and 600 plus acres of land. As for Lucille, for the time she spent in the house, she ended up paying $20,000 in rent. It appears that Michelle and the heirs were kind enough to accept the discounted rate. And after Lucille vacated the house, she moved right across the street. Today, she could stand on her new porch and see the ranch and her old house off in the distance. Perhaps none of this would have happened if only Steve had left behind a will, a signed will, putting the house in his mother's name. If he'd thought about his death, wouldn't he have considered who the ranch went to? I had so many questions about this will. Who had seen it? Who had copies? Why had Steve never signed it? And so I called the one guy who I thought might have some answers, Steve McNair's agent and attorney, Bus Cook. You know, after he died, you know, there were some questions about whether or not Steve had a will. You had said that he had made a, a draft of a will, but he didn't sign it. Or what, what do you remember about Steve's will or, or whether or not he had one? Well, as I can recall, there was several times that a document was prepared. And for one of the reasons, they never got signed, but Steve did, uh, through other estate planning means, take well care of his family. He did have an estate plan, and it was good. Okay. Do you know why why he never signed the will? I have no idea. I just, you know, just like a lot of people, I guess, he never got around to it. I think the law in Tennessee is, I'm not sure what the law in Tennessee is, but I'm sure it's present, or I'm not sure you're in that state, I think a period of time in your, if you have a will, it has to be drafted in and uh, done within the state uh, to comply with those state statutes. Did you have a copy of the will? Like, was there ever a thought of? No, I did not. I mean, you know, and, and let's move on. I mean, it's, you know, what else you want to talk about? You know. Okay. Okay. I told you he had a good estate plan. He planned for his family, took well care of him. So what else? I asked him about what Doc Simpson and Jerry Fletcher had told me. 
Do you know anything about Steve losing a lot of money in a bad investment shortly before he died? What kind of investment? What was he supposed to be investing in? I don't know. Steve never confided with me with all that, you know, type stuff. I mean, I sure he, he and I talked a lot. But, I mean, you know, Steve had his own mind and did his own deals and stuff sometimes. You know, like the rest of them. I didn't know about the rest of them. Until it was, after, you know, after the fact, I didn't have anything to do with setting it up or establishing it. We just sent what Steve wanted to do. I asked Buss, wasn't he the one who recommended the CPA and the banker to Steve? Buss said Marsha Wright, the CPA, did work for some of his clients. But he brushed off the question, saying that the CPA and the banker were, quote, home folks that Steve met through business with those folks or whatever. I asked Buss, did Steve and Michelle have a prenup? Well, I mean, if he did or he didn't, it wouldn't matter because it was never it would never come into play. That's the way things turned out, so it wouldn't have mattered. Were you involved in, in drafting it? You know, I'd you know, like to say, whether it was drafted or not, that would be something that was between he and his wife, and nothing ever came of it, so it's not relevant to anything. Then I asked about Lucille McNair's house, and what do you remember about that whole episode between Michelle and Lucille? And here... Bus really came alive. It was as if he'd been waiting for this question. That house was built for his mother by Steve. Okay, to live in, use, occupy as long as she wanted. Okay. When Steve first got drafted, Steve, they asked him what he was going to do with his money. He said, the first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to build my mom a house. And they asked him what kind, and he said, the kind my mom wants. And he built his mom a fine home. And uh, Steve's intention was to come back to Mississippi and live in use and occupy that house. When Steve passed, that house was in his name, okay? It wasn't in anybody, it wasn't in anybody else's name. It was in his name. And the courts have an obligation to protect the interests of minors, okay? So when Steve passed, that house became part of his estate which was then equally owned by his wife and his children. And the court uh, had control of what would happen with that house in in order to protect the children. So to say that Michelle kicked uh, Steve's mom out of the house or made her pay rent, all that is just absolutely ridiculous. It's people that don't know what the law is and what the courts require in the protection of minor children. And since they owned... Each one of those children owned a 20% interest in the, uh, in Steve's estate, and that house being part of the estate, the court has to protect the interest of the children. That's, Michelle did not you know, tell Ms. McNair, you got to pay rent or you got to do that. That is absolutely not true. The court may have said something to that effect just because of the children's interest in that property, and that's the court's obligation is to, regardless of who, Parents or grandparents or brothers or sisters, anybody else is the obligation of the court is to protect the children, and that's what they were doing. And nobody was trying to kick Miss Lucille out of the house or anything else. That's just not accurate. Bus is making it out as if Michelle had absolutely no choice but to sell Lucille's house, which isn't really the case. I reach out to Eric Carlberg, a probate lawyer at Prince Lobel in Boston. He reviewed for me all of Steve McNair's probate files from Tennessee and Mississippi, and he brushed up on the Mississippi probate law. Eric told me there's no law that would require Michelle to sell the house. Eric and I also tracked down four Mississippi probate and real estate lawyers, and they each told us the same thing. Michelle wasn't legally obligated to sell. Now, it may have been convenient for Michelle to sell the house in the manner that she did and split the proceeds of the sale five ways, but Michelle and the heirs could have also held onto the house and shared ownership of it. That option was more expensive and more complicated, but it was an option. It just would have required all the parties to agree to keep the property and perhaps pay for its upkeep, all for the sake of Lucille McNair. Again, all of this could have been avoided if Steve had left behind a signed will. Before I got off the phone with Bus Cook, I couldn't help myself. I asked again about this mystery will. You you never had a copy or you don't know where where it's... I don't know what will you're talking about. I mean, a copy of what will? Well, I thought... know something that we don't know i mean i don't know like you said at some point steve had drafted a will you don't know what happened to it or you don't know where it went i don't know as far as i know he never signed a will never saw one don't know one i mean you know, it seems we never prepared one early on in his career or something i don't but if he if we did he didn't sign it no matter what bus cook says doc simpson would still like to see steve's will signed or unsigned 
He has questions for the CPA and banker, too. We reached out to Steve's banker, and he declined to comment. We also tried several times reaching out to Marcia Wright, Steve's CPA, and she never returned our messages. Doc finds that strange. There are a lot of unusual things that have gone on that have never been brought to surface. Steve's death is not just about his relationship with a 20-year-old girl. His death is about money, power, so forth and so on. And I would really like to see a forensic audit done on everything that he had from the time he went into the NFL up until his death to see where the money went. Because there's still some money not accounted for. Yes, there remains a rumor that after Steve McNair died, a large amount of his money went missing. Doc suggested that there were people who owed Steve money at the time of his death, people who'd be motivated to see that debt erased. Paul Walwyn, the Nashville defense attorney who consulted with the Kazemi family, told me he'd heard from a reliable source that a check issued to Steve for, quote, a very large amount of money had gone missing. Again, there are so many rumors, there's so much hearsay floating around this case, that it's hard sometimes to figure out which tips are worthwhile and which are not, which are rooted in some semblance of fact and which are all fantasy. The best way to clear up some of this stuff, go directly to the source. Next week on Fall of a Titan, we'll talk to the detectives who handled the Steve McNair case, the people who wrapped up the case after just four days. Still to come on Fall of a Titan. There is evidence that Steve was out there and he was playing with fire. The sister is conveying to us that like, hey, she's getting a little bit more aggressive and now it's becoming a little bit more volatile. He was really walking a very fine line and he put himself in a very difficult position. He really did. And that, that's really what, what needs to be looked at. Nobody knew this piece of information. It changes the whole dynamic. Could that happen here? I don't know. Given the scene evidence, given the investigation, I think it'd be highly unlikely. Hi, this is Tim Rowan, host of Fall of the Titan. Thanks for listening. If you're enjoying the show, please make sure you subscribe and leave us a review. Also, be sure to check out our hub page at si.com slash McNair, where you can get documents, videos, and more material associated with the case.